The views and opinions expressed on this program are not necessarily those of this station, JVC Broadcasting Management, or its sponsors. Welcome to Crime and Justice Radio, where we talk all things crime, justice, mayhem, and the courts with expert insiders and legal outcasts. My name is Aida Lysenring. I'm your host, along with my co-host, Bruce Barquette. Happy Monday evening. (laughs) I'm happy. It's a good Monday evening. It's fall. I actually enjoy this weather, the crispness. It gets a little dark. The clouds look a little different. The sun's a little lower in the sky. It's kind of cool. You know, Halloween's coming. Thanksgiving's coming. Christmas is coming. All good. Change of the seasons are great. So we have a great show tonight. Um, Different. Different? Why is it different, Bruce? Because instead of talking to people who actually are advocates within the system, we're going to talk to a person who can actually change the system. Congressman Lee Zeldin. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk to him about his run for governor and if successful, what changes he will seek to make in the administration of criminal justice here in New York, because it's got to have a crime and justice slant, right? Well, that's the title of the show. Well, that's the thing that we know something about, probably more about than most people. So, And then yeah. we have a second guest, someone who is near and dear to us. Uh, we're totally biased. We love him. His name is William Flanagan. He's a retired deputy police commissioner of Nassau County. A cop's cop is how he was known. Um, and back then it was actually a compliment. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it actually, and it still is for him. He's, he is one of the great human beings I've had the privilege to meet over the course of my life. And he has a very um, interesting take on the criminal justice system from a variety of perspectives. We'll leave that hanging there for now. And, and when we get to talk to um, Bill... Uh, he'll fill us in on, on uh, his views of policing, the criminal justice systems, its flaws, and so forth. So we'll see how that goes. Before that, I want to talk about something co- that I'm going to call, I started it off with calling it strange defenses, but I'll change it to just defense strategies, right? Sure. <laughs> you're I not think, enthusiastic no, about no, this No, no, no. I think I know where you're going with this. You're we not... started jury selection for Ahmad Arbery. And obviously, I, I don't know if it's interesting to people because we all saw the video. We all seem to think we know the facts of the case. And the matter seems absolutely and utterly indefensible. Well, what, what happens? And there's this old adage of... If you don't have the facts, you pound the law. If you don't have the law, you pound the facts. And if you don't have the law or the facts, you pound the table. And pounding the table is one of the things that defense attorneys do pretty regularly because oftentimes their clients are... I've uh, literally seen you pound the table and and, and almost (laughs) knock your head into a brick wall during a trial. (laughs) It's happened from time to time. Um, Some of the frustrations uh, take over, although I've never cursed in court. And I've never been held in contempt. Well, I, I I didn't curse. Sorry, this is totally a side note. But remember when I was talking to Donna during a trial? You actually did curse. I didn't curse. It was it was amongst ourselves. It was a, it, the trial was not in session, and I said, "Holy sh!" Right. And so forth. And the judge overheard me and got bawled scold- me out got scolded in for front it. of the whole media, yeah. even though you should not have been listening to me. Well, that's okay. So look, uh, the Ahmad Ar- Arbery case is crystal clear, I think. But what interests me about it is the defense, which I think is just bizarre. They're claiming that they were trying to make a citizen's arrest and that in the course of that arrest, when they confronted this young man who really wasn't doing anything at the time they confronted him, with a shotgun and began to threaten him, he fled and then fought for his life and was shot to death in the street. And shot to death being filmed by one of the co-conspirators or one of the the defendants in the case. And so their defense is, well, we were making a citizen's arrest for a burglary that supposedly happened about seven months before this and for which there is absolutely no evidence that um, Ahmad had anything to do with that and or a trespass, apparently there was a a dwelling or a building under construction with literally nothing but the studs in, and Ahmad wandered through it, took a look around, just curious as people are from time to time, and left. So for that, he died. 
and were supposed to believe that what they were doing is making a, quote, citizen's arrest, and the fact that it was a young black man in their neighborhood uh, had nothing at all to do with it. And the picture of these white individuals driving through uh, on the back of a pickup truck, getting out with a shotgun and shooting this young man is, is really troubling. But the, the strategy here, rather than kind of working out some kind of deal or... Right, because what if your bizarre. clients won't plead guilty or what if the prosecution won't give you a deal? As a defense lawyer, what do you do in that circumstance? I, I guess you come up with anything that you possibly can. So it's not a strange defense. It's a defense and possibly the only defense, but we know it's a failing one. As as well it should be, but look, I, we've had cases like this, right? We've had cases where there really isn't any defense, and you have to do your best to work around it. And I, I hope that we weren't didn't embarrass ourselves the way I think these lawyers, forgive me, are embarrassing themselves. If they uttered the words "citizens arrest" in the course of this trial, they should have their license taken away or something. It's just absolutely absurd in my view. But that's just me. I mean, I I I agree with that proposition and i agree that this defense is not going to work out and frankly it shouldn't but and uh, contrast it with uh, you you don't know your audience right so we it's a different audience it's a different community rural county in georgia and maybe citizens arrest there are more common than one would imagine up here and I'm certainly not justifying it, but they have to get to the self-defense, which means they have to get to why they were chasing after him in the first place. So it's strategically, right. Right. he may be doing that for a reason, right. but... We'll, we'll contrast that with Nicholas Cruz, who is the individual who killed 17 people in the Parkland shooting, who's facing the death penalty. They're not facing the death penalty. He is, Nicholas Cruz. And rather than put up some nonsensical defense, he's going to plead guilty and argue at sentence that he shouldn't be executed. But that's a... That's not really a fair compare and contrast, right? Because he's facing the death penalty. And one of the biggest mitigators for jurors to not seek the death penalty is if someone has remorse for their crime. And upfront pleading guilty with absolutely no promise is probably as strong a statement towards remorse that one can make. It is, and I don't want to trivialize any of this, but when I was a young prosecutor, we used to, uh, I dealt with speeding tickets. It was my first, my first venture into the trial courtroom, if and, you will. And now you get prosecuted for them <laughs> no, all the time. No, it's not true. <laughs> so, and one of the things we used to say to people, they'd come up and say, well, I was speeding because, and I said, well, you're not saying you're not guilty. You're saying guilty with an excuse. So tell it to the judge. Maybe he'll give you a lower fine. And they're like, oh, okay. And that's sort of what Mr. Cruz is doing. And maybe I would suggest that's what the defendants in um, Mr. Arbery's case should be doing as well, pleading guilty with an excuse. Of course. Um, Well, listen, let's get to it because he doesn't have a lot of time. He's a busy man. I want to introduce him for the very few that haven't heard of him. Congressman Lee Zeldin. He shouldn't need an introduction to people on Long Island, but we have listeners from outside this little neck of the woods. Congressman Lee Zeldin grew up in Suffolk County. He graduated from Albany Law School and became New York's youngest attorney at the time at the age of 23, which I think is very endearing. And after completing the Army ROTC program, Congressman Zeldin served four years on active duty. He served as a military intelligence officer, as a prosecutor, as a military magistrate, and other uh, capacities, and while assigned to the Army's elite 82nd Airborne Division, he was deployed to Iraq in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. He currently serves as Lieutenant Colonel, and he was elected to New York State Senate in 2010, elected to Congress in 2014 from the 1st Congressional District, which is mostly Eastern Long Island, and now he seeks to be Governor of New York, which is kind of since the last two years, the most famous position in America. Well, welcome, Congressman. Thanks for joining us. It's great to be with you. Thank you for the uh, the warm intro and uh, looking forward to chatting. Yeah, sure. So tell us, why do you want to be governor? We have to save our state. I mean, this isn't just some slogan. Uh, I'm talking to New Yorkers across the state who are hitting their breaking points. Uh, the emotion the passion, the hunger that they have, talking about why they are seriously thinking about fleeing the state that they have called home. Uh, it's last stand time to many of them. Uh, they feel like this isn't an option to lose. Uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm with you 
too, for those folks who are thinking that the, our wallets, our safety, our freedoms, our kids' education is uh, are all under attack right now. I'm, I'm seeing it. Many of my own family uh, over the years have left. Uh, I, I have like friends who have left. Yeah, they've it, left it, New York it, City and they've moved to Florida. They've, it really is stunning to see people fleeing the city the way that they have, and really all of New York. Yeah, it's, it's happening every single day. and It's uh, people of all walks of life. It's uh, having your first kid in the basement of mom and dad's house uh, or owning your home. It's a senior who has spent their whole lives here. They love it here. They don't want to leave their families here, but they just can't afford to stay. And it's also the people who are pretty well off. They're more mobile than ever. And instead of paying taxes to New York, on the billion dollars they made last year, they decided to call their accountant, their attorney, and flee to Florida for six months and a day. And people might be like, well, you know, who cares about them? I'm not talking about in the context of them individually. I'm talking about what that means for the bottom line of the state when businesses, job creators, uh, and all that, that tax money goes. Well, it, it, you know, people should go back and read Atlas Shrugged, right? The Aunt, old Anne Rand novel where all the people who produced just kind of vanished off the world at some point, uh, went to a mountain or something, and the individuals were left without the in- people who produce. And you wonder what society will look like without the successful individuals, without the people who are uh, building things, making things, earning money for themselves and for their employees. Just saying. Yeah, hundred percent. It's uh, you know I, I value every single job that exists, uh, every opportunity that's out there for the state to tap into our own resources, uh, as opposed to relying on others. Uh, we are making such a, a horrible uh, point right now and trying to convince a business somewhere else to move here or that that portable business here in the state to stay. And uh, I, I remember not just the consequences of Amazon specifically not following through with moving their headquarters here, but what was remarkable were the other companies speaking out saying they, they were thinking about coming here. And because they saw the way that AOC and her friends were treating Amazon, they said, well, what's the point of us trying to move to the city? I'm, I'm not doing that. And they had second thoughts. And, and these are jobs. It's it's jobs and, and money. And I live in Long Island City, so I remember the impact of that. Um, let me ask you this, because I, I know a lot of uh, conservative politicians often blame bail reform on the rising crime. But what I think is interesting is not having all these businesses producing jobs kind of creating more traffic on the street. One of my friends who's a judge said, the reason there's a there's more crime is because there's less people on the street. There's less witnesses and people kind of run amok. Do you think that, I mean, we'll get to bail reform in a second, but do you think that has had an impact on crime, poverty, quality of life? Yeah, I mean, one way of us looking at it is to say that there are 100, 200 different factors. I mean, you're pointing out one. Uh, I, I believe that it's just a, com- uh, it's a combination of a lot of factors that make criminals feel like they're ruling the streets instead of cops, that the handcuffs are getting slapped on cops instead of on criminals. And you just, you've lost that feeling for law-abiding New Yorkers that they are owning their local streets as opposed to uh, people who seek to do them harm in different ways. And it's, there's a lot that there's the economic piece of it, sure. There's an education uh, component of it. There's just feckless leadership. Uh, there's uh, a, a reduced morale uh, within law enforcement, retirement packets uh, on the rise, suicide on the rise. Um, but I, I believe that, that the cashless bail piece is huge. The attacks on qualified immunity, uh, the push to, I mean, as we saw in your city, to take a billion dollars and uh, push for even more to come out of their budget. Uh, they're they're uh, emptying out Rikers Island, and we're seeing people immediately within two or three weeks getting themselves rearrested. There's a whole bunch of specific criminal justice related policy changes 
uh, that I, I really do believe are the biggest impact. Um, but to your question, I definitely think that the economic piece is a part of it. So, so tell us, I mean, if you can, what are some of the changes that you'd want to make as governor? You get elected, what are you going to do to our criminal justice system here in New York? Well, generally, first I would say that I, I support our law enforcement uh, unapologetically. I would want to support them more, not less. That shouldn't even be a controversial position, but somehow that's become a minority position in the state capitol. We need to turn that around. I do want to repeal cashless bail. I support keeping qualified immunity. I want to see the state enact a law enforcement bill of rights, recognize law enforcement's right to self-defense, make sure they have the tools, the resources they need to do their jobs safely and effectively, make sure they aren't unfairly targeted by investigations. I was raised in a law enforcement household. I have a background myself former prosecutor. I was a military magistrate. Uh, I have found that law enforcement wants to hold law enforcement accountable when they do something wrong, but don't try to vilify the other 100% of that department uh, made up of amazing selfless men and women who love their job and they're doing it for all of the right reasons. Uh, I, I do not agree with the push where the governor puts out an executive budget each year. You're threatening to close prisons for political purposes and uh, trying to get senators, state senators, state assemblymen expending all their bandwidth just to fight for keeping open a local prison. They're just doing it part of some kind of a, a budget game. Uh, so th- there's a lot that goes into this. Uh, and, you know, and, and as I pointed out earlier, and you were talking about with the economic piece, and uh, th- th- there are individuals who are out there who do need help with uh, with mental health, with homelessness, with uh, with drug addiction, with alcoholism. There, there's so much more that we need to be doing, but at the core of it uh, is a pretty significant reversal in the direction we're going with the laws that are being uh, the laws are being proposed and changed let me let me ask a question about a specific topic that we touch upon on this show pretty regularly which is the death penalty um, you've been outspoken in favor of it and I assume that you see what we all see is these numerous wrongful convictions that make the news almost every week it seems like somebody who's been in jail for decades is being released. How do you rationalize those two things? A system that's got its flaws and a punishment that's irreversible. Well, one, we should always be aspiring for any way to make the system work better. Uh, and we have, ha- we have had advancements uh, in the way to uh, produce, to analyze, to use evidence. And uh, that aspect of this shouldn't be lost on anyone. For me personally, when I think of the Boston Marathon bomber, if I'm thinking of anyone out there who uh, thinks that was a, a great idea and they want to do that themselves, uh, I support the death penalty. Uh, Are you going to seek to bring it back in New York? Uh, I, I believe that, that, that it should exist in all 50 states. It's a decision made uh, by the individual states of whether or not to apply it to their own laws. Um, but, yeah, I mean, as it relates to the, the justice, the deterrent effect, uh, the uh, reason why we have a criminal justice system, uh, I believe that people need to know when uh, committing certain acts of crime that uh, that there are severe punishment. I mean, on the other end of this extreme, and also tied to the last question that you asked me on the streets of you know, New York City, there are certain crimes that just aren't being prosecuted anymore. There's a push inside of New York State uh, that they want all sorts of different low-level offenses to just be decriminalized or unofficially just not pursuing charges on. And whether we are talking about some of the lowest level crimes or some of the most significant uh, I- impactful uh, crimes as far as the way that it harms uh, innocent lives, innocent New Yorkers and others, uh, I just feel like there's a lot more that we need to be doing. Uh, look, I know your time is limited. We wanted to touch on one more thing, if you can, which is because it's so widely talked about and it's been in the news a bit today. Not the vaccine itself, but the mandates and the way New York City is imposing uh, the well, vaccine. New York City, the mandates for all healthcare workers, the resulting Teachers. job loss, the 
you know, virtually no exceptions. I want to give you a chance to comment on that. Yeah, the first is, I mean, bottom line, they're wrong. Uh, the <laughs> mandates are wrong. I mean, if you're a struggling small business owner in New York City, you barely survived the pandemic because of Bill de Blasio's lockdown policies, and now they're telling you that you have to turn down that good-paying customer uh, because they didn't show their passport or because they're not vaccinated. I mean, that, that's a problem for the healthcare worker who is held as a hero, who is given parades, all of a sudden, they're put out on the streets. They don't have a job because they haven't gotten uh, their first shot by September 27th. And the way that some of these uh, employers are pursuing the termination as well are, are really extra over the top. And this point last year, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Andrew Cuomo, and others, they were all sowing distrust in the vaccine. They changed their mind a few months later. They decided <laughs> I wonder if the election had anything to do with that. I'm just curious, right? Yeah. Who was who president? Right. Is your, no doubt. I mean, they, they actually said that out loud. Um, I mean, it, they specifically would reference President Trump in their criticism and sowing that distrust. But then they decide to get vaccinated. And that's their, that's their choice. Right. You, you, you've, you've been isn't great. choice a you've beautiful been, thing? You've been great with your time. I hope you come back and chat with us again. Thanks very much. Good luck Thank in your you, campaign. Thank you, Congressman. We'll talk to you again soon. Take care. All right, have a great night. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Welcome back to Crime and Justice Radio. I'm Aida Leisenring, and I'm here with my co-host, Bruce Barquette. And we are delighted to introduce a spectacular guest who is, as I said earlier, near and dear to our hearts, uh, Bill Flanagan. Let me tell you a little about William Flanagan. He was a member of Nassau County Police Department for 25 years. He served 29. As, 29. Oh, there we go. Someone's editing my work. He served as a second deputy commissioner from 2009 to 2012, serving a population in Nassau County of 1.3 million people. His career assignments included commanding officer of asset forfeiture and intelligence bureau, supervisory roles in the narcotics bureau, the major offense team of the detective division, patrol division, and the hostage negotiation team. He was the department's longtime representative to the national major cities Chief Intelligence Committee, and during his tenure on the committee, he participated in working groups charting the course of nationwide fusion centers for intelligence sharing frameworks. And he initiated some of these amazing high tech and kind of people forward programs, such as Shot Spotter Deployment, Reach, Return Every Adult and Child Home, Gun Stoppers Tip Lines, Gun Buyback Program, Shed the Meds too good for drugs and the heroin awareness campaign all were developed and implemented during his tenure he's now the principal of a boutique firm specializing in providing consulting services by subject matter experts on law enforcement security critical infrastructure protection retail engagement and technology applications across a wide spectrum of industries and i could literally go on for the rest of our program but we actually want to hear from you welcome bill (laughs) and he's a reasonably good golfer from what i understand so that's all good (laughs) welcome bill (laughs) good to have you here how are you doing i'm doing well hey listen i eat first thing i want to confirm the table pounding I've seen it, <laughs> but, but 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 really for your audience, that's why that's why he was while he was making a record, and and people have to understand the, the you know the the how, how strongly that defense attorneys need to do things to get their point across to preserve a record to make a record. Uh, people don't get that. And I'm going to tell you something. I mean, you know me, I've been around for a long time. I've seen a lot of defense attorneys. Uh, Bruce brings it to to the highest level there. He, he may get, but but he's totally wrapped, and it's totally about doing the right thing for his clients. Well, thanks. Really thanks. Happy. Thanks, Bill. I, I wish that I did it successfully every single time that I went out, uh, but it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. <laughs> it's, it's, that's, that's the game. That's the game. So um, you're look. still you're so you're still tapped into uh, policing all across America, and you've got uh, tons of people that you continue to work with and sources. What is happening with law enforcement in America as you see it right now? You know, you know, we're really at a, at a time and place that that 
sometimes you have to step back and take a look at, right? I mean, you look at the level of violent crime today versus the late 1960s through the early 1980s. doesn't compare at all. Those were very violent times in our history. Um, subsequent to that time, the police, the judiciary, prosecutors' offices, and, and, and social, you know, social welfare organizations really put a dent in, in crime. But we've gotten so used to that, that baseline level of, of violent crime being so low that this is a slap in the face with what, what's, what's perceived to be happening right now. Um, and, it, and it needs to be addressed. I mean, a lot of it's driven by, and, and your previous guest, uh, Congressman Zeldin, I think he nailed some of this. You know, he was talking about a little different thing, but it was emotion, passion, and hunger. What drives things today? Emotion, passion, and hunger. Rationality takes a back seat when we're driven by emotion all the time right off the bat. You know, keywords, de-escalation, um, intervention, things like that. Uh, you, you really need to interrupt this, this process, this emotional process that happens uh, oftentimes in, in police um, community encounters. I mean, and it, it, it's foundational. And, and thank you for saying that, because you hear the media headlines like New York crime up 730 percent. I'm making that figure up, but it's it's so crazy what the headlines are that I'll get calls from my uncle in D.C. and he'll be like, how you doing, Aida? Is everything okay? Are you, are you staying safe? And I walk out on the street and nothing really looks that different, except I will say this, since the pandemic, um, I see more homelessness, whereas before well, I didn't see it on the street. But well, I, well, I think it's the social disruptment that has contributed. Look, we, we don't want to compare ourselves to the worst time ever and say we're not that bad, so things are okay. It's clear Correct that there's been a turn over the last couple of years to an increase in crime, an increase in violent crime, and it's a trend, and trends tend to continue. So if we don't abate it now, we're going to have a bigger and bigger problem as we move forward. And look, you know us, we're criminal defense attorneys uh, by day, and I'm a, you know, a father and husband and homeowner by night, um, so we're, I, I tend to be somewhat conservative in my approach because I want a good place for me and my kids to live. Um, so I, I, I don't dislike the police by any means, some of my best friends, right? But it, you need to find some balance here. And I think in my view, and correct me if I'm wrong, the city is out of whack. It's out of balance. It has slipped off a cliff on a kind of the pendulum swing to a point that makes no sense to me, even as a criminal defense lawyer. And start with bail, I, I, right? Start with bail reform. It, Yep. I, I think you're correct, Bruce. I, I mean, let's face it. Human beings deal best in stasis, right? A state where everything is essentially balanced. This is out of whack. And I agree with you 100% that trends need to be dealt with. And right now, the trend isn't being dealt with, and, and specifically in large urban areas in, in the United States. The, what have, what's happened to the police? They've essentially backed off, Right. And, and I have to go back to historical times again. We saw the same thing in the 70s in, in New York City when police officers were ordered not to make arrests of, hand, uh, of, of drug deals that happened directly in front of them. Different, different set of circumstances, but same thing. My fear here, really, if I have any fear, and, and what I see is an almost a normalizing of heretofore illegal or criminal behavior, right? Um, it, to, to, to gain equity. Equity versus egalitarianism is what the way I'll put it. Equity is everybody. It's brought to a certain level. Egalitarianism, which is, which is really key to me in policing, is treating everybody the same until they give you a reason not to. Uh, in, in my own life, um, as, a, as a police officer and the people that work around me and with me, I always try to impart the feeling that Listen, I want to deal with everybody just like I'd want someone to deal with my family until you give me a reason not to. Uh, retired, so, sorry, retired commissioner of, of Nassau County Police Department, Mulvey, once said of you, if he is biased at all, his bias favors the underserved, not the elite. Listen, my, 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 my family comes from basically a, a poverty background. My father was born essentially in an Irish ghetto. 
Um, I get it, right? There are there are things outside the purview of the police that the police, like teachers, have been have been forced to deal with because nobody else would. And and both um, were very functional pieces of government, both both the education system and and policing, right? Um, but but you throw so much stuff in there, and you don't give people resources, and you don't you know, training and everything else, it becomes problematic. The, the biggest thing that I see today are these are the interaction between community and police. And and Tip O'Neill, former Speaker of the House, said it best about politics. Well, politics is local. Policing in the United States is, is our local issues. The power of the police devolves from the people that they police. That's one of the basic tenets. There's a guy, you know, English guy, name was Sir Robert Peel, had these nine principles of policing. And, and the first one really was about the police are needed to keep order at, at, at and I'm paraphrasing a bit, um, at, the, at the behest of the public. Otherwise, it takes, it, it goes to repression, usually by a military organization. Look at places you've traveled to around the world where the police are truly Military, it, militarized. It, you can't tell the difference between the police in and Spain. Well, but, I feel but like I'll that's true. I, I think you know you, you touch upon something that I I think we we are seeing here, and that's part of the defund the police movement is that the the militarization of the police departments with you know what people will call tanks, uh, the way they dress, the weapons they have, uh, the helmets, the you know they tend to look like military. Um, and and some of the vehicles that they've used look like military vehicles. So it, it there's something perhaps to that. Uh, hey, again, Bruce, uh, you know, I mean, that's such a it's, it's like guns and the police. I mean, if you really if you took a look at, at the necessity and the utilization of firearms by the police in the United States, you'd find that, that most cops I don't use the term, you know, broadly use their mouth, not their guns. I mean, it's it's it's. It's such if you if you look at the eight hundred thousand law enforcement officers in the United States and the tens of millions of interactions between police and those people, it, you know, statistically, it's an infinitesimally small number. When it goes bad, it's terrible. But but physicians, we all go to doctors. The numbers range, and I'm going to go with a conservative number. Somewhere about one hundred fifty thousand people a year die as a direct result of the actions of a uh, of someone in the medical world. I mean, it's not malicious, and, and nor are are 99.9% of the the unfortunate fatal involvement with, with truly innocent people with the police and fatal encounters, but we could talk about that for hours. I, I look at it, everything is so hyper-politicized today relative to policing and authority. And it comes down to these, again, let, let's go to what people really have keyed on over the last 18 months or so. And it's the street encounters between the police and, and people of color. Um, and, and, and the horrible results that have happened across the board as a result of some of those things, right? We look at it, the, there's, there's, there's sometimes a lack of communication. There's a lack of respect that goes both ways. And, and there's almost a, a, a look at the police today on the street by some people, they act toward the police essentially with impunity. And that's, that's, really, pro- that's really, really problematic. So what, is that, what, what does that push? It pushes what I call contempt of cop, right? The police tell you to do something, the cop gets ticked off because he didn't, you didn't follow his you know, direction or whatever. And it turns into something that should have been nothing, probably more than, uh, you know, figuring out some some well, other way that some, somebody doesn't wind up incarcerated. Look, you can, you can see sense. some of the examples of this when it comes to arresting individuals for what are relatively minor offenses. They resist, and it, it escalates, and you're to mm-hmm. a point where, you know, somebody's getting dies as a result of selling cigarettes in the streets of Staten Island. Right. That, right. And, and, well, that was probably a poor example, Bruce. It's not, it's not a poor example. That's what it was. He was selling cigarettes <laughs> no, and got but he, arrested. but he didn't resist. Well, he, he didn't resist. He, he didn't comply. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't com- resist. He didn't deserve to die. He didn't, I didn't say he did. <laughs> okay. I didn't say that's just my point. He didn't right. comply. He didn't comply with the directives of the cops. They started using 
uh, uh, compliance techniques. Right, but police need to be trained in dealing with that. That's the whole point of being a police officer. You're not an average citizen dealing with someone in a strange situation. You're a police officer that knows how to deal with all sorts of unexpected circumstances, right? And hopefully, and hopefully that training that's given to people, and I'm going to tell you something, you know, you know I, and I'll go back to the Nestor County Police Department. Um, de-escalation has been part of the basic curriculum of training police officers for decades in the Nassau County Police Department, as in many what I will call <laughs> progressive police departments across the United States, right? That doesn't mean that the failure point is not the individual. It happens. It happens in every industry. Human beings are the weak link in things all the time, right? But they are human beings. And here, again, heretofore, the laws that were passed by whatever the respective state legislature allowed the police to make mistakes, right? Because the police were doing functions that the average person does not want to deal with, frankly. You know, the average guy doesn't want to step into a bar fight. The average no. guy doesn't want to, you know, show up. At, Except at a, for Bruce. At well, I, I haven't been in a, <laughs> he wants to pick a fight. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't been in a bar fight or any fight in 50 years. Uh, I think that's actually true. And you talk about de-escalation. It's something that we run into. It's a, it's a good example all the time, right? You're in an argument with somebody. Or maybe you're in a bar or someplace else. There are physical things that you can do to de-escalate. Don't raise your hands. Stand still. Don't confront the person. Don't lean in. Lower the tone of your voice. There's all of these leave. things. Hear leave. them out. Listen. <laughs> right? Leave. Yeah. Right? True. Yeah, leave. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you, you know, I, I, I just... You, 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 you commented before about bail reform and, and, and you know, things like that. I, I, and, I, and I, frankly, I think I do have a little bit of a unique perspective. You know, I've been in jail um, relatively short period of time. But, but you know, it was a it was an interesting time in my life. And I won't comment on the politics and all the other stuff that, that led you there to where we well, where we went. We can. But, but, <laughs> you guys could. But but here's here's what I found out. You know, I spent, I don't know, about a month, um, most of it in a general population uh, environment. And and with, at that point, you know, 30 years of police experience behind me, looking around, and say there were 60 people in this particular unit, um, I'm going to tell you that half of them probably didn't belong there. There was another half that belonged out of, out of, out of in, an interaction with society, because as they were sitting there looking at doing bits upstate or, or whatever, they continued in a, in a what I'll call a criminal mindset to be to to look forward to continuing their business, which was being predatory and preying on other people. Now, they happened to be in this particular unit because they probably had some, you know, alcohol or drug issues that underline some of their behavior, but they were, they were clearly not in a mode to remediate that behavior in, in any way. Right. So, so, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's very interesting. There's, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things involved here and we, we, people want to paint things with a broad brush. We had one of, one of your colleagues on a good friend of all of us. Pat Ryder was on. And he he made he's the commissioner of the Nassau County Police Department now, uh, and he made the point that you know rough the statistics are not exactly right, but he said most of the crime is committed by a very very few amount of people. Most of the violent crime is committed by a few amount of people, and the trick, if you will, or the skill set of law enforcement and the criminal justice system is to separate those individuals who are committing the crime from society while not kind of sweeping up the dolphins with the tuna, if you will, right? You have to Absolutely. be able to, to separate out the people that are truly dangerous and need to be there. So you said half and half, roughly. Well, half of those people shouldn't be there, and the other half should be there. How does the system get fixed so that the people who belong in jail or in prison are there and the people who don't and don't need to be get out? Well, the part, of the process, part of it is the process itself is onerous, and, and nobody knows that better. You know, you see the whole thing. And, and, and the, the beauty of the legal system, at least in New York and other places I've been exposed to, is so many people, competent people, go from the ranks of, you know, 
prosecutors, at least line prosecutors initially, and go into the defense world. And really, really good defense attorneys understand the process um, and 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 execute on that process to the, to the betterment of their clientele. How does that happen? To start with, it's got to start with the police being impartial. I mean, that's a huge piece that you can't direct the police to go fulfill, and, and I'm going to tread on some dangerous ground here, mask mandates. Right? I right. get it. Right. Uh, um, it, it, it <laughs> it's more dangerous than art in this corner. <laughs> okay. And, and the other piece of it is that the police, I, I really I really push back when, when people I know, well-intentioned, um, you know, deal with the police as, or, or equate the police to warriors or, or uh, punishers. That's not the role of the police. It's not. It's to, it's to, it's to react to something or to prevent, hopefully prevent long before reaction, right? I mean, right. Terrible jobs of, we do terrible jobs of preventing preventable homicides. Right. Because it takes, it takes interact. It takes some significant interaction. But, but, you know, the, the, this whole thing, everything's related to everything else. It's all interrelated. We have real problems. Look at look at how many during the nineties, look how problematic certain parts of the city of New York were with with frankly flat out criminal acts by the police and probably some prosecutors in in wrongfully convicting people. It's oh, yeah. it's it's horrendous. Horrendous. I, I, I have to believe today that that the incidence of that has gone down, hopefully, just just by virtue well, of scrutiny and awareness. Well, I, I think it's gone down also. And, and jurors have become more educated uh, as well, so they understand concepts like mistaken ID, whereas they wouldn't before. But, but right? there aren't any idea. The, the idea that there's single witness ID cases are long since gone with video surveillance, right. cell phone techniques, right. DNA, and all the rest of it. Uh, we have the quality of evidence really has improved significantly since 20 years ago, and the number of cases, thankfully, is gone. Bill, it's been great chatting with you for a few minutes. Thanks for giving us the time. Uh, it's Always a pleasure. Getting it was text great. messages as we speak. <laughs> Fascinating conversation. Your popular guest. <laughs> Fascinating conversation. Thanks very much. We'll see everybody back um, in a week for another edition of Crime and Justice Radio. I'll be back with my co-host Aida Lysenring. Thanks for listening in tonight. Have a good Monday evening. The views and opinions expressed on this program are not necessarily those of this station, JVC Broadcasting Management, or its sponsors.